Hello, this is Dr. Amy Toon, and I'm going to record um, a lecture regarding how to do an eye examination. The eye examination overview, you want to measure both near vision, distal, distal vision, and peripheral vision. Near vision is used, uh, measured by a Rosenbaum, distant by a Snellen chart, peripheral vision by a confrontation test. You want to inspect the eyebrows for the following, hair texture, size, and extension. On the eyes, look at the orbital area for the following, any edema, redundant tissues or edema, or any lesions around the eyes. The eyes are very tender tissue, so a little bit of um, pressure there and they will swell rapidly. Inspect the eyelids uh, for the following, the ability to widen and loose and uh, loosen completely, eyelash, posi eyelash position for ptosis or any fasciculations. Uh, ptosis is an eyelid drooping, fasciculations or tremors is where the eye uh, tremors. Flakiness, any kind of, um, that would be like seborrheic keratosis, where there's flakiness around the eye, usually the eyebrow any redness or erythema, any swelling, and then you palpate the eyelids for any nodules. You want to inspect the orbits and fill around the bones of the orbits and pull down the lower lids and inspect and palpate the, um, the conjunctiva and the sclera. And you also want to look for color, discharge, lacrimal gland um, production and any pterygiums and I'll show you a picture of a pterygium in a minute. Um, a pterygium is due to dry eye and it's an overgrowth of the epithelial tissue. On the eye you want to inspect the external eyes for corneal clarity, corneal sensitivity, corneal arctus, or the color of the irises and papillary size and shape and not papillary pupillary size and shape and pupillary response to light and accommodation and um, you can do that by just swinging the light where you put the light on and off the eyelid um, on the eyes, you're going to palpate the lacrimal gland in the superior temporal orbital rim. And you also have a lacrimal duct, which goes up on the inner side of the inner canthus along the, na the nasal area. And you're going to evaluate um, balance and movement. And um, The corneal light reflex is going to tell you if there's any kind of um, it's going to tell you if there's any kind of stigmatism. The cover on cover is going to tell you pupillary rea rea reaction to light, which is part of cranial nerve number two, and the um, six cardinal gazes are going to take test. 3, 4, and cranial nerves number 3, 4, and 6. The ophthalmic um, examination is going to look for lens clarity, red reflex, retinal color, and lesions, any characteristics of the blood vessels, and the arteries are a little bit bigger than the veins, disc diameter, is how you measure everything, but they're going to be talking. You won't know a disc diameter when you look into a fundus if you don't look at the optic disc and know how wide it is. So you're going to look at the disc characteristics, and they should have clear borders where you can see artery and veins going over clearly without any blurring of the lines right as it goes over into the optic disc and macular characteristics and the depth of the anterior chamber. OK, 
Okay, looking at the anatomy and the physiology, we're going to, um, I'm looking for a pointer real quick, but I can't find it. Um, one of the things that you have to review is the anatomy of the eye. Okay, in your chapter 11 on eyes, you start off with this picture and you just need to review the parts of the eye. As the light comes in through the cornea, it goes to the pupil and it's going to go through the lens into the posterior chamber and in here it is filled with visc viscous humor um, and it's going to basically get into your optic nerve. But you have a lot of arteries that get things into it and you want to examine the entire fundus and the optic disc. The eye transmits signals to the brain for interpretation and occupies the orbital cavity and they develop an embryo attaches by four rectus muscles and two oblique muscles and it's cranial nerves number three, four, and six that move the eyes. Um, and so you see here that your left eye will be interpreted by the right side of the brain and vice versa. On the external eye, um, you have got um, five structures, the eyelid, the conjunctiva, the lacrimal gland, and the eyelid, uh, the eye muscles themselves in the bony orbit. And I talked here before about you having a lacrimal gland and you have a lacrimal duct, a nasal lacrimal duct that's right here by the nose. It is possible to milk this thing and you can get all kinds of discharge from there, but it's usually white fluid that will come out of there. Um, but milking that nasolacrimal duct, especially sometimes on babies, it just will come out and, and um, this will be all red and swollen and all you have to do is push from the bottom and out will come some discharge. The external eye, the functions are to distribute tears over the surface of the eye, to limit the amount of light entering the eyeball, and to protect the eye from foreign bodies. The conjunctiva protects the eye from foreign bodies and um, dissection, uh, dissection, and um, the lacrimal gland produces tears that mo most moisten the eye. And the eye muscles, the, each eye is moved by six muscles, and it, there's a superior, inferior, medial, and lateral rectus muscles, and the superior and inferior oblique muscles. And they are innervated by cranial nerves um, three, four, and six. So there are your muscles. And here's the eye range of motion. And I'll show you an um, easy way to remember the cranial nerves. And it's all by a drawing of a face. I'm going to show you that later. I'll, I'll post it with this. The ocular eye movements, um, they, they move the eye up and down, back and forth, and laterally. The internal eye is, has three layers. The outer fibrous layer and the sclera post, um, posterior and posteriorly and anterior. The middle layer is a crocoid which is posterior and ciliary, biliary, iris, anteriorly, anterior layer. The retina, five major structures are the sclera, cornea, cornea iris, lens, and retina. And the sclera is the white of the eye and it's um, avascular and it supports the internal eye structures. The cornea is um, continuous with the sclera anteriorly. It's clear. It's a sensory innervation for pain. And it's a major part of the refractory power of the eye. Uvula, uvia it consists of the iris, ciliary body, and um, the coracoids compromise the uveal tract. 
The iris is a circular contractural muscular disc containing pigment cells that produce the color of the eye. And the ciliary bodies produce the aqueous humor and contain the muscles controlling accommodation. And um, realize that the um, Realize that the choroid is a pigmented, richly vascular layer that supplies oxygen to the outer layer of the retina. The internal eye um, has the lens and its transparent structures located immediately behind the iris and it's supported um, circumventally by fibers arising from the ciliary body and there's contraction and relaxation of the ciliary body changes its thickness. It changes in lens thickness, allows images from very distances to be focused on the retina. And the retina has a sensory network of the eye and it transforms light impulses into electrical impulses which are transmitted through the optic nerve optic disc and um, back to the brain. And the retina, what it does is it interprets um, pulses as visual objects. And its major landmarks of the retina are two that you need to know and one that you have to know how to examine, the optic disc, <clears throat> which is where the optic nerve originates together with the cranial artery um, retinal artery and vein. The macula or fovea, also called the fovea centralis, is the site of the central vision and you have to look into the light to see it. As soon as you do that, the eye tends to constrict, the iris tends to constrict a lot. Actually, the pupil is what constricts. Infants and children's eye forms during the first eight weeks of gestation and they become malformed due to maternal drug ingestion or infection. Lacrimal drainage is complete at birth. By two to three weeks of age, the lacrimal gland begins producing full volume of tears. And the vision in kids, um, term infants are 2400 and um, it takes until they're about five to six to have 2020. Um, So your book has it around five. Pregnant women are hyposensitive and changes in the refractory power of the eye. Tears contain an increased level of um, lysozyme resulting in a greasy sensation and, and perhaps blurred vision for contact lens wearers. The corneal um, edema thickens and worsens in pregnant women and diabetic retinopathy can worsen and interocular pressure falls and subconjunctional hemorrhages often occur during um, birth but they resolve spontaneously. So the take-home message of this is your vision changes when you're pregnant. Don't get glasses at that time because it's three months after your pregnancy when everything's back to normal, two to three months later. Um, postpartum, you are going to be at a different spot. So if they do get any glasses, get the cheap ones because it will change rather quickly um, for their vision. Older adults, the biggest thing is they have lack of accommodation and focusing power and this is known as presbyopia. And so seeing an object far away and close and far away and close um, like reading street signs is harder and harder for them. There's a loss of lens clarity and cataract formation also. So on the left you see a snowflake cataract which is common with diabetes. It looks like snowflakes in the middle of that pupil. And in the right you see a senile cataract to where they can't see through very much and it's very clouded lens. So let's review the history. We got to ask people if they've had red eyes. And if they did, 
<clears throat> what was the kind of discharge? Um, if there's difficulty with vision, was there pain, history of eye surgery, and did they have any kind of other illnesses like an upper respiratory illness? Any allergies? Um, are their eyes itching or are they just discharging? And if there's any secretions and what medications? The easiest way to get these secretions out of eyes, especially on babies, because it's um, sometimes these secretions mat and in the morning their eyes are matted shut. Most people will go ahead and put a warm washcloth on it, but if you will just add some baby shampoo to that warm washcloth, you'll be able to, to breathe these eyes really simply without having to be near as hard on the eyelids and the um, eyelashes as without the baby shampoo. And it doesn't hurt the eye at all if the shampoo gets in the eye. All right. Back to past medical history, trauma, eye surgery, you look at chronic illnesses that affect the vision. There, you can have hypertension and atherosclerotic um, cardiovascular disease can affect the retina. Diabetes definitely does. Glaucoma, inflammatory bowel disease, thyroid um, dysfunction and autoimmune diseases and HIV can also change the um, division. Family history, a retinal blastoma. It's a, this is often an autosomal dominant disorder and a retinal blastoma is the most common type of eye cancer and this is where when you see somebody in a picture they got a red reflex on one eye and white on the other uh, that should be a clue. And You've got something in the eye that's causing it to be white. Glaucoma, macular degeneration, diabetes, hypertension, and others may have impact on the vision or on health. And color blindness, um, that can occur. So you check color blindness, especially on DOT physicals, because they've got to know the street light colors. So you've got to check color blindness on that for just DOTs. And that's about the only time outside of doing a Department of Transportation physical, it's about the only time you really test for color blindness. Uh, cataract formation, retinal detachment, and um, retina, retinitis, pigmentosa, or allergies that affect the eye. Nearsighted, severe nearsighted, that means they can't see things far away, or far sighted, they can't see things near, it's just opposite what you would think. Strabismus, or um, amblyopia. And what I'd like to say is with nearsighted and farsighted, especially with the nearsighted, the eye instead of being round gets more and more oval with the nearsighted. And the more oval the eye is, the more likely the retina on the back of the eye will be to detach. And that's why they're at such a risk for retinal detachment with severe um, nearsightedness. On this right here is a picture of the retinal blastoma, the most common retinal tumor in kids. And this is the one that I said you're going to see it on a kid by looking at a picture and they've got one red reflex on one eye and the other eye is white. And they have to take it out or take out the eye. So the treatment is surgical. Unfortunately, this baby was shaken. This is a white baby post-mortem and um, shaken baby syndrome. So, uh, got another picture of that in a black baby later on. Um, personal and social history, you want to look at activities. You want to see if they're around smoke a lot, and this can be, you know, like campfires, um, wood burning stoves, as well as cigarette smoke. Cigarette increases the cataracts, so does any kind of smoke. And what also increases cataract formation is not wearing UV protection on your eyes. Um, you also um, 
have glaucoma more with cigarette smoke and macular degeneration and thigh eye diseases, thyroid eye diseases. Okay. Um, when it talks about activities here, you want to look at what they're doing like for employment, particularly if they've ever welded. And if they've welded, did they ever have a foreign body in their eye? And why you really want to know that is if they've ever had a piece of metal in their eye and you order a CT scan, that metal is going to come out in a very abrupt way because it's little flakes in the eye. So it is well worth it before you order, I said a CT, I'm sorry, uh, whenever you order an MRI that the flakes are going to, if they have flakes of scrap metal, or something from welding in the eye. Their eye accommodates the heels over it. Just be sure and ask them about the history of welding and if they've ever done it without goggles on. And if so, you might want to go ahead, and I do, get one x-ray and it's $40 for an orbital x-ray to make sure that there's no foreign bodies in the um, sclera or in the cornea prior to you doing the MRI. Um, it's well worth that 40 bucks. If they don't well from the time you do the first MRI to when they ever they need a second one, that's okay not to do another one, but it is important to get that initial one if there's any doubt in your mind at all. Get an orbital x-ray. Infants and kids, preterm, you want to find out if they've been preterm and um, if they have any symptoms of congenital abnormalities uh, like failure to gaze and um, or not blinking with bright lights or strabismus, some or all the time. And um, now, whenever any of the babies are put under billy lights, they'll tape the eyes shut so they won't burn the retinas like they used to back in the 50s. Okay, infants and kids with young kids, look for excessive rubbing of the eyes, frequent hordiomas uh, or styes, and ability to reach for and pick up small objects, night vision difficulties on school aid kids. Um, you want to look at necessity of sitting near the front of the classroom to see the board or poor progress in school not explained by intellectual ability. Pregnant women, they can, there can be a presence of disorders that can cause ocular complications in pregnancy, such as pregnancy-induced hypertension or diabetes. Um, symptoms indicative of PIH, or pregnancy-induced hypertension, are diplopia, seeing double vision, um, sclerotomata, um, and blurred vision. And you also want to um, talk about the use of topical eye medications that may cross the placenta. And so you want to look at those closely because there's several that will. On older adults, you want to, what's going to happen on them is the visual acuity is decreased in the central vision. There's a distortion of the central vision or the use of dim or bright light to increase visual acuity. There's complaints of glare or difficulty in performing near work without lenses. And um, there is excessive tearing, dry eyes, a development of scleral brown spots, nocturnal eye pain, and a sign of subacute angular closure and a symptom of, is a symptom of glaucoma. So nocturnal eye pain, like I'm sleeping but my eyes hurt, you need to think of glaucoma first. Also, if someone loses vision in just one eye, their midlife, um, then you need to think of multiple sclerosis until proven otherwise, especially with monocular vision loss. And when you do an Ambler grid, it will be central vision loss. That's going to be MS until proven otherwise. Okay, examinations, and what are you going to do with them? 
Well, you're going to get a Snell and I chart and um, realize that it's when you read this, it says like 20 over 20 or 20 over 30. Realize it's always the person reading it over a group norm. So if you have 20, 40, that means that person can, that's you're examining can see at 20 feet what the group can see at 40 feet. The Rosenbaum is the near vision card and um, you also need a pin light, cotton whisk, ophthalmoscope, and a gaze cover or something to put over an eye for confrontation. The visual testing, central vision, the ancillary grid, near vision, the Rosenbaum chart, peripheral vision, confrontation test, test each individual eye, test with and without corrective lenses. If vision is less than 20-20, you can conduct a pinhole test. And this, um, what you do is you put a hole in a piece of paper, a little hole, just poke it with a pen and um, an ink pen, and be able to um, look through that hole. And they should be able to see at least one line better if it's a refractory error is responsible for the diminished activity. On the Rosenbaum, there's a green line and there's a red line. And if they cannot read um, below the green line, they need glasses. And the red line is right at the 2020 point. So, below green, you need glasses. Um, they should be able to read below the green line, is what I mean. Okay, external examination. The external examination is performed in a systematic manner beginning with appendages and moving inward. So what you're going to do is look at inspection and palpation, surrounding structures. You're going to increase eyebrows, I'm sorry, you're going to inspect eyebrows for size, extension, and hair texture. Inspect the orbital area for edema, puffiness, and sagging tissue below the orbit. Eyelids, look to see if they uh, are closed. Do, are there any fasciculations? Are there any tremors? Check ability to close completely and open widely. Um, observe margins for flakiness, redness, and swelling. Look for eyelashes and note any eye opening and pitosis, which is a droopy eyelid. And note for any eversion where the eyelid droops out or inversion where it goes in towards the sclera and scratches the lid of the cornea. Eyelid palpation, you palpate for nodules, palpate the eye itself through closed lids, digital Palpation or tonometry is something that you can use um, to tell the eye, the inner global pressure of the eye, and ask regarding pain. Conjunctiva inspection, it's usually um, an apparent clear, clear and free of erythema. Inspect the lower lid by pulling down the lower lid. The upper lid is inspected only if the foreign body is in the eye. Look for redness or exudate. And look for pterygium. And that is going to be the abnormal growth of the conjunctiva that extends over the cornea from the, the lambus. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, and the cornea... Um, you make sure there's clarity by shining a light on it, but the light has to be to the person's side of their eye. And you want to go on the lateral side of the eye and shine the light towards the nose. The cornea is normally a vascular. Blood vessels should not be present. You want to test sensitivity, the cranial nerve 5, by touching the cornea with a cotton whisk to elicit the blink. 
inspect for corneal arctus or, or arctus sinalis, composed of lipid deposits in the periphery of the cornea. You want to look at the iris and the pupil, pupil and inspect the iris for pattern, color, and shape. Test for direct consensual light response and test the pupils for accommodation. The pupils should constrict when the eyes focus on the near object. And you need to estimate pupil size and compare for equality. On the lens, you want to inspect for transparency, transparency and clarity. The sclera examined to ensure that it's white and inspect for senohydrolin plaques. On the lacrimal apparatus, inspect the lacrimal gland and palpate the lower orbital rim near the intercanthus. Extraocular eye muscles, you want to test the eye movements using the six cardinal fields of gaze. Check for an astigmas and note lid lag. Lid lag. Um, note the exposure of the sclerus above the iris. And you should not be able to see the sclera above the iris or below the iris on most eyes. The exception to that is Mediterranean people um, from Spain, that area. And they tend to, you can see it on one side. If you can see the sclera all the way around the iris, you got exophthalmos with some lid retraction. Um, use corneal light reflex to test the Extraocular muscle balance. If in balance, perform the cover uncover test. Ophthalmic examination. You're going to examine the interior eye with the ophthalmoscope and you look at the optic discs, arteries, veins, retina, and adequate pupil dilatation is necessary. You want to visualize the red reflex and the opacities appear as black densities. Examine the fundus and the vascular supply, disc margins, and the macula. Look for unexpected findings such as myelinated nerve fibers, papilla edema, glaucomous cupping, drusen bodies, cotton wool bodies, and hemorrhages. As you look at the macula, or you look at the retina, the big thing to look at is this optic disc. You want to make sure that the arteries and the veins that are coming over, that this is called the disc margin, and the artery and the veins that are coming over it need to be clear where there's no blurring of the lines right as this disc margin is set. And the reason you really want to know that is because if there's any edema of the optic disc or retractions, there's going to be blurred lines. And you worry about edema because if there's any pressure from the brain going out towards the eye, this is where you're going to find the pressure valve. And this, it's going to bulge and it's going to come out towards you. You don't, it's hard to tell if it's coming towards you or going away from you but it tends to only come one way, bulging out um, toward you. And if you bulge out, you're going to have blurred arteries and veins that are going over the optic disc. The other thing that you want to look at, and you realize that this is the left eye because the optic disc is towards the, the nose, and um, you're going to look all around the disc and make sure that it's a uniform color as you go around this disc. And then, as you go towards the ear on any eye exam, which is what you want to do last, you're going to hit the fovea centralis. And this is what some people call the blind spot, because as soon as you look this way, or look there, normally the patient is looking out at a fixed object, not looking into the light, but just looking at the wall at a fixed object while you're doing this. What you're going to do is you're going to have them look into the light and when they do that you're going to be able to spot the fovea centralis which will just appear just like this, a little darker area that's smudged. That's about all you get before that pupil constricts down on you. 
here are normal fundus findings on this is on a white person and this is on a black person so I just wanted to let you know what the retina will look like normally on a black and a white person you don't really care about the color here as much as you want to check these arteries and veins coming over and are they smooth you can see these are smooth on the white person on the black person there's a little bit of blurriness and here's what catches my eye up here around 11 o'clock there's another little spot so which is abnormally colored and there is another one right here and Drusen bodies look different on a black person but basically it's going to be a different shade of color so you're going to look for a different shade of color on a white person they look more yellow or white so that's what I think this is right here, a Drusen body and a Drusen body. So here is a better picture of a fundus of a white person. Here's the right eye, here's the left eye because the optic disc is towards the nose. Here's the fovea centralis that you see um, on the right eye. And you see that you got good arteries, see how the arteries are bigger than the veins? And the arteries, they come over the margins and they're clear. You got clear, crisp disc margins. On the picture B, it is going to be an absolutely clear, crisp, clip, crisp disc margin. Clear, <laughs> clear, crisp disc margin. Get that tongue twister out. And you're going to see that the artery and the veins over the optic disc are clear also and there's your fovea centralis okay here's a bigger picture of this a normal eye on a black person except you've got a white spot here and here so or a lighter spot that might be yellow but on the black skin it looks more white than it does on a white or lighter retina so um, you do see that these come over the the margins and they're clear you can see the margins of the arteries you can see them here also so this is a normal fundus of a black person now we need to talk about background retinopathy uh, or diabetic retinopathy and what you're looking for is these little hemorrhages okay see how this one is and I mentioned that back on this picture saw a white one here and a white one there and that's why I thought that they were um, retinopathy or they're called Drusen bodies too but it's diabetic it's usually diabetic retinopathy changes that will happen so um, this is what you're looking for the soft exudates on the retina. On an infant, uh, look at the symmetry, muscle balance, and presence of the light reflex. Inspect lids for swelling and look at the epicanthal folds. <clears throat> Inspect the eyelid levels. Note eye spacing, how wide are they apart and how are they in spacing with the ear. Inspect the sclera, conjunctiva, pupil, and the iris. Test your cranial nerves, uh, your vision, you want to observe an object and just something that they can focus on. Look for an optical blink, closure of the, um, you note the closure and the head response to a bright light. The corneal reflex is the same as an adult, you can do a puff of air to the eye and they should blink. Um, the fundoscopic examination is deferred until the infant is two to six months old unless there's visual problems. Usually all you need is a red reflex in newborns. In children, the external structure inspection is the same as the infant. The visual acuity with the Snell and E game starts at three years old and that's where they're saying which way the E opens. The visual acuity tested in younger children by observing their activities 
and peripheral vision is tested in a cooperative child and cranial nerves are tested the same as adult and fundoscopic exam requires practice, practice, practice. Okay, here's the retinal hemorrhages of um, shaken baby and this is a black baby and you see that this just tore his entire retina off. I mean, this was violently shaken baby. And this bad is usually, the babies usually don't make it. Okay, and there it is in a white baby, but it's post-mortem, and that's why it's got this grayish appearance to it. So that throws it off a little bit. Um, the pregnant women retinal exams differentiate between chronic hypertension and pregnancy-induced hypertension by just asking them if they've had hypertension prior to their pregnancy. Look for vascular um, torturous or um, tortuosity or angular sclerosis or hemorrhages and exudates that are seen in a patient with a long-standing history of hypertension. Pregnancy-induced hypertension, however, um, has includes segmental or arterial narrowing with a wet glisten appearance, appearance indicative of edema. And you have to be careful with the drugs in the eyes because it can be systemically absorbed. And those are the two most common to go and look out for. So abnormalities. On the external eye, exothalamus is a bulging of the eye anteriorly out of the orbit. And you can have eplosclerosis and inflammation of the superficial layers of the sclera anterior to the inspection of the retinous muscles. Band keratopathy, and um, it's a deposit of calcium in the superficial cornea, a corneal ulcer, and we'll have some pictures of that. And you realize that this eye, you see the sclera on the bottom and on the top, it's exothalamus. Um, extra us extraocular muscles, strabismus, uh, both eyes, that's when both eyes do not focus on an object simultaneously. Paralytic um, strabismus, one or more extraocular muscles on their nerve supply is impaired. Non-paralytic strabismus, patient can focus on either eye but not with both simultaneously and may be a sign of increased intracranial pressure. What you see here is xanthalasma, and this is because they've got lipid deposits around the eyelids. It's common with people that have high triglycerides. Once it's there, it will always be there. Regardless of what you do with their triglycerides, this will stay unless they have it cosmetically removed. On this lady here, you see pitosis on the left eye where there's drooping of that eyelid. And this can be due to anything from um, Lyme disease to psychiatric issues. Um, there's, it's all over the map what can cause this. But uh, you see that that left eye is not opening as much. Now, what I would do on this patient is have them raise their eyebrows, and you're going to notice they're raised their eyebrows, but the eyelid on the left eye won't go up anymore. And here is um, uh, epitropian, and this is where the eyelid bulges outward. And the problem with this is they're going to end up with chronic dry eye. And irritation because this needs to be against the um, cornea and the problem is otherwise you're going to get bacteria there so you get dry eyes and eye problems because the eye does not shut properly obviously an elderly lady because she's got some natural sun protection factor there with a droopy skin Okay, this is just the opposite, where the eyelids have gone in all around, and um, they scratch the cornea, and it's entropian. 
And this patient on the right has undergone a corneal transplant also. This is an acute sty or hordulum of the upper eyelid. When you have this, you do not want to pluck it, you do not want to pop it. What you want to do is simply put warm, moist soaks on it and it will go away in three days. Wash the eyelid and um, the, the eye area with baby shampoo to make sure that you don't have any other secondary bacteria just sitting around. But this is something you want to just let heal on its own. Pleparitis, and this is where you got a bacterial infection. To get all this matting off from all of this discharge on the follicles, use the baby shampoo. Okay, conjunctive acute purulent, conjunctivitis, and you see that they've got this purulent, cloudy conjunctiva. This is probably bacterial. You can have this um, when it's just viral, um, but you can figure out by the history, have they had another upper respiratory infection or virus, and it usually happens when, especially on young kids that cough in their hand and then rub their eye. This is a subconjunctional hemorrhage and this is common with severe coughing and with labor and where there's a lot of pressure. It will, a blood vessel erupted in the um, sclera. No big deal. It self-absorbs on its own and resolves on its own. It just looks horrid. Um, and this is what would happen, how long does it take to go away? About four to five days. Also, with um, severe coughing, sometimes you find edema and um, or severe pressure around the eye with some swelling. There will be edema enough that it looks like the sclera has got bulging out and the iris is recessed. And that's the kind of thing that a little bit of steroids in the eye will make a world of difference. Okay, and this right here is the pterygium. And this is more common on dark-skinned people than it is on light-skinned people. But there's a lot of pathologies to this, but this is epithelial cells. And um, it happens a lot with dry eye. And people that have chronic dry eye, this epithelial cells just grow up. And what they've got to go in there and shave off with a laser these epithelial cells to get it to calm down. But what does help retard but not retreat the progression is just lubricating eye drops. And wear sunglasses. But that's a pterygium. And this right here is Cornell's um, Circus Sinalis. You often see it as Cornell Sinalis. And on here, you've got a general clouding of the entire lens. Right here, you've got strabismus. And what it is, is all you got to do is cover one eye. And you have this person look at you, and when you uncover the eye, this eye has just wandered off. And um, the pupils are not tracking at the same time. This is a corneal ulcer, and um, this corneal ulcer you see is right here. How you test this is with a little bit of stain in the eye, and this stain, the why you want to use the stain is you don't want to give any kind of steroid in the eye that might have a corneal ulcer because it will delay the healing. So you want to be sure and go ahead and stain the eye with some fluorescent stain and um, prior to putting any kind of steroids in that eye. You won't do wrong with the antibiotic um, and that's what the treatment of this is some kind of topical eye drop antibiotic <coughs> or ointment. Um, but the steroid, why people like it is, it knocks down the pain and the inflammation quick. But first you got to make sure you don't have a tear 
If you do have a tear, use an antibiotic only and do not put an antibiotic steroid combination into that eye. On the inner eye, Horner syndrome, in, I'm sorry, in the internal eye, Horner syndrome, it's a triad of meiosis, mild ptosis, and a loss of the hemofacial sweating. It results from an interruption of the sympathetic nerve supply to the eye. And um, you also can have cataracts and opacities in the lens. So here's Horner syndrome in the right eye, and it's just got some opacities to it. The internal eye, you can have the diabetic retinopathy, dot hemorrhages, and microaneurysms, and the presence of hard and soft exudates. The diabetic retinopathy can be proliferative in the development of new vessels as a result of anoxic stimulation, and it can be lipemic. Um, retinalis occurs when serum triglycerides exceed 2,000. And um, so here you've got pro proliferation of the diabetic retinopathy, and again, here you see these white patches or lighter yellow patches. And you see a couple of dot hemorrhages, flame hemorrhage there. Um, the retinitis pigmentosa is an auto -recessive, um, autosomal recessive disorder in which a genetic defect causes cell death, predominantly in the rod photoreceptors. You can also have glaucoma, which is a decrease in the optic nerve resulting in increased interocular pressure. <laughs> and one of the things you will do is palpate the eyes. They should feel about the consistency of the grate. They should be bilateral. Um, but that's a slow sign. It's a slow developing sign for glaucoma. Nerve cells die in glaucoma, producing a characteristic appearing or optic a nerve with increased cupping of the optic disc. Um, and you can also have a retinal inflammation and that's an inflammatory process involving voice, both the cor choroid and the retina. Choroid and the retina, excuse me. Um, this is one you cannot miss. That means it's probably going to be on a test. And you see here, you cannot see the margins. And you cannot see the arteries and the veins coming in. And that's because this whole disc is coming anterior, more than the retina. And this is severe papilledema. This person will go blind. It's got to be treated. It's got to be treated very aggressively immediately. So this papilledema is one thing that all nurse practitioners are expected to know. So be aware of that and know what it looks like. What do you do about it? Refer them to an ophthalmologist immediately that day. Okay, here you see a couple of um, hemorrhages at the disc margin. And here, see how these just fan out? They're called flame hemorrhages. On the visual fields, um, defects, you can have a defective vision or blindness in a single eye. Or you can have um, bitemporal partial vision loss. Um, and that's usually done like you lose the inside vision of both eyes or you can lose the outer side, um, the lateral side of the vision in both eyes. But look for a pituitary tumor or something along the nerves that are going back to the eye at that time. Um, children, retinal blastoma is the, the embryo. It starts out in the embryo, and it's a malignant tumor arising from the retina where you get the white pupil instead of the red reflex. Retinopathy of prematurity is a disruption of the normal progression of retinal vascular development in preterm infants. 
and um, and this was it depends on how small they are but the little babies that are about one and two pounders this is not um, this is a pretty common thing um, and those little ones and retinal hemorrhages and in infancy occurs in infants and that are victims of the shaken babies and that's because their heads have literally snapped back and forth and it's like a concussion in the eye but unfortunately by that time it's battered the brain enough that the child tends not to make it or have permanent brain damage so keep well and how you do that is realize that there are age-related macular degeneration um, and keep your eyes moist and reduce the high time that you use um, screen time and something to tell you in grad school you know and um, and realize that um, there's been a preservation and vision and reduction of age-related macular generation in individuals taking high dose antioxidants plus zinc so take your antioxidants keep your immune system up thank you the antioxidants will also keep your immune system up there's no other correlation between the immune system and your eyes and macular degeneration thank you and have a nice day